comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And so hear now the word of God. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I, so I am sending you. Then he breathed onto them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one they called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger into the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the door was locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in the scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, through weak human words, give us grace to hear your true and living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we begin this new worship series, I wanted to frame it in the context of the story of Jesus. Acts 1-3 says, After his suffering, he showed the He showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to many different people in different ways to demonstrate the power of God and to prove that he was resurrected. For over for the next five weeks, we'll look at some of these stories of the risen Christ's interactions. We'll look at the stories of the resurrected Christ interacting with people. And what they can teach us about living on the other side of Easter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, we'll look at the story of what picks up right after the scripture I read last week on Easter Sunday. We, we pick up right where I stopped. When it comes to the lectionary, which is a three-year rotation of scripture that is preached off of, this piece of scripture usually comes on low Sunday. This Sunday. The Sunday after Easter. It's this classic interaction between the resurrected Jesus and one of his disciples, Thomas. But many of us know him by doubting Thomas. Thomas gets this rap because of this moniker. But I wonder if doubting really is that bad. Doubt is what enables our faith to grow, I would wager. Yes, you've heard me correctly. Doubt is what enables our faith to grow. The passage of scripture I read today tells us this. It is through doubt that we receive faith and a deeper understanding of who God is. In the beginning of this text, Jesus appeared to the disciples and they believed. They were so excited about the resurrection and Jesus showing up in person, they had to share it with others. Thomas, we hear, was not in the room with them. And when he heard what had happened, he did not believe what the others were saying. He said, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, place my fingers where the nails were and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas had little faith in what the disciples were saying, and he needed more proof. Now, this is something we ask for all the time in our lives. We all are doubters at some point, but that's okay because I think actually it's a good thing. Many people believe that if you doubt, you are actually a non-believer. 
But I think people think this way because they cannot bear thinking of believers who actually have doubts. Yet we all have moments when we are exactly like Thomas in this scripture, wanting God to prove that he exists so that we can believe. Author and neurologist Oliver Sacks writes this about his religious experience. He says, there, is, there, has been, there had been some religious feelings of a childish sort in the years before the war. When my father lit the Sabbath candles, I could feel almost physically the Sabbath coming in, being welcomed, descending like a soft mantle over the earth. But when I was suddenly abandoned by my parents, as I saw it, my trust in them, my love for them, was rudely shaken, and with this, my belief in God too. He continues to write about an experiment he came up to prove the existence of God to himself. He writes, I planted two rows of radishes side by side in the vegetable garden and asked God to bless one and curse the other, whichever he wishes, so that I might see a clear difference between them. The two rows of radishes came up identically, and this was proof to me that God did not exist. But I longed now even more for something to believe in. Now we humans, we do this all the time, don't we? We decide the best way to see if God exists is to test God ourselves and, more importantly, in our way. We ask God, if you really exist, make all the lights to work green this morning. God, if you exist, please let me get a return on my taxes this year. God, if you exist, let my father live through cancer. God, if you exist, make my wife forgive me. We think that we can test God, and then we will believe. Yet was Thomas actually a non-believer, testing the existence of God? No. Thomas was a disciple. He followed Christ through his ministry on this earth. He heard Jesus' teachings and the parables. Thomas was there when they experienced miracles. He knew who Christ was, but still could not believe what the disciples had told him was true. Maybe it was too good to be true. Maybe he doubted their news because he too was scared for his life and afraid of the persecution. Maybe Thomas was actually jealous that he missed seeing Jesus and wanted that experience for himself. Whatever the reason was, Thomas states that he would not believe until he saw the scars in Jesus' hands, placed his hand in Jesus' side. Thomas wanted real physical proof. To solve Thomas' doubts, Christ comes again to the upper room and talks directly to Thomas. He tells him, put your fingers here, see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas, I am guessing, was dumbfounded and was amazed to become face to face with the risen Christ. He had, he had seen what had happened to him earlier and knows for certain that Jesus was dead. Now he is physically in front of him. And And this turns his doubts and his questions into undeniable faith. This was not the first time Thomas had questions. Thomas is just like us. He is a questioner. He does have a keen intellect. He he tries to understand in practical terms what Jesus is saying to him. Most of us know this situation, this story of Thomas in our Bible. But Thomas has been eternally smacked with the moniker Doubting Thomas. But yet less remembered is Thomas's comment back in John 14. It starts off with Jesus saying this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, what I have told you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas's question here provokes some of the most well-known phrases of Jesus. 
Here in this passage, Thomas is making sure that he and the disciples can be in the place that Jesus promises and wants to make sure that they know the directions. Thomas seems to be very practical. He's honest and intellectual. Thomas doesn't just want to take Jesus' word for it. He, he wants to process it, to digest it, to make sure it settles before he can believe it. Thomas does not blindly accept faith without question. He doesn't believe to simply believe. My grandmother uh, always had a way with stories. As a child, my sister, cousin, and I would go camping with her over the 4th of July. And one day we were eating watermelon in the hot West Virginia sun, and my grandmother was sitting outside with us in her sandals. It was in the midst of this watermelon seed fight that us three were getting into that I noticed, and I looked down at my grandmother's feet and saw that she was missing part of some toes. And that was really weird to me. And so being a curious six-year-old that I was, I asked her why she didn't have parts of those two toes. And she looked at me and without missing a beat or cracking a smile, said, well, one day I was walking near a railroad track near our house and a train came by and my foot was a little bit close to the train and they just, the train cut it off. And without a thought, I was like, huh, and then spit another watermelon seed. It wasn't until I was 22 years old and I was sitting with my family at a dining room table after she had passed away and then I was confessed this story and my dad broke out into one of the heartiest laughs I've ever heard him, almost to the point where he was crying. And it was between gasps of breath that he laughed and that I learned that she had a tendency and love to tell stories like this, but none of them were true. For 16 years, I took what my grandmother told me as truth. She got too close to a train, and it lopped off a little bit of her toes. I never really thought about it. I never really thought that it could be false until my dad broke out in such a hearty laughter. Then my six-year-old mind caught up with my 22-year-old mind, and I started to realize, oh, I get it now. Sometimes questioning life every so often is not a bad thing. We should do it. When we ask pertinent and relevant questions, we get answers that can deepen our faith and provide us with tools that we need to move into a closer relationship with God. Former Chicago Tribune journalist Lee Strobel writes this. He says, For much of my life I was a skeptic. In fact, I consider myself an atheist. To me, there was far too much evidence that God was merely a product of wishful thinking, of ancient mythology, of primitive superstition. How could there be a loving God if he sends people to hell just for not believing in him? How can miracles disobey the basic laws of nature? Doesn't scientific reasoning dispel belief in the supernatural? As for Jesus, didn't you know that he never claimed to be God? He was a revolutionary, a, a sage, a model Jew, but God? No, that thought never occurred to him. I could, point you, I could point you to plenty of university professors who said so, and certainly they could be trusted, couldn't they? He continued, let's face it, even a hasty examination of the evidence demonstrates convincingly that Jesus had only been a human being, just like you and me, although with usual, unusual gifts of kindness and wisdom. But that's all I had ever really given the evidence, a hasty look. I had read just enough philosophy and history to find support for my skepticism. A fact here, a scientific there, a pithy quote, a clever argument. Sure, I could see in some gaps and inconsistencies, but I had a strong motivation to ignore them. A self-serving and immoral lifestyle that I would be compelled to abandon if I were ever to change my view and become a follower of Jesus. As far as I was concerned, it was case closed. There was enough proof for me to rest easy with my conclusion that the divinity of Jesus was nothing more than a fanciful intervention of superstitious people. Or so I thought. Lee Strobel, who wrote this years ago, started looking into this guy named Jesus for two years. He became a believer, a follower, a disciple. He became a prolific 
teaching, uh, a prolific author, teaching minister, and now is a professor of spiritual theology at Talbot School of Theology. Lee's doubts and questions have been transformed by the risen Christ. Many Christians think they have it all together. They think they have their faith, and it's as strong as it always will be. It's unwavering. They think that any ounce of doubt or even one question that comes to their mind means that their faith isn't strong enough. But doubt comes with life, because life comes for us all. We'll all have events in our lives that make us question why things happen. God, why did my sister get cancer? Why did my dog run away from home? Why and how can people be so evil? Yet should we be ashamed to ask God these heart-filled questions? When Jesus was here on earth, people asked him questions all the time. The Pharisees asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The rich young ruler asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Paul asked him questions all the time, like, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everybody? Everyone around Christ asked him questions, and Christ would always answer. In today's passage, we receive a common theme in Christ's way of answering. It is one of compassion and care. It is one of understanding and gentleness. When Thomas stated that he did not believe unless he saw Jesus, Jesus did not come back and ridicule him. He simply said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. When Thomas saw this, he believed and cried out, my Lord and my God. And it was through Thomas's doubts and questions that it turned them into a feeling of belief. No longer did he walk around with a void of doubt in his soul, but Christ came and filled it. Thomas experienced the power of belief. And that is possible for all of us. You too can have the assurance that Thomas has. You can have the answers to the questions that you are seeking. To find them though, We need to learn to stop testing God by subjecting God to our rules. We do not have to plant two rows of radishes to test God's existence. A light turning red on our way home does not mean that God does not exist. To find the answers you seek, you need to be asking the real questions. You need to be able to listen to God for answers. You need to be willing to be transformed by the power of the resurrected Christ who may show up through the answers you find. Christ might not visit you in person like Thomas, but he will speak to your soul. And it's in that feeling, those nudges, those realizations, those moments of assurance that converts our doubts and our questions into faith. And all God's people said, let us pray. Lord, we have many questions. When life comes at us, we question so much. We give you thanks that you are a big enough God that you can take all those questions upon yourself. So may we freely ask, but then also may we freely listen to experience your presence in our midst through the people, through a congregation, through the ways that you whisper to our souls. May we come to you with all of our doubts and questions. And may you give us an undeniable and unwavering faith. For it is in your Son's name, our risen Lord and Saviors, that we pray. Amen.